didn't have to limp along in life for years and years and years. And then finally, I had a revelation. Hey, I don't have to walk powerless. I can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Jesus, it says it's for me and my children. It's a great day to be alive. It's, it's the day the Lord is made. I uh, was asleep a few weeks ago. Actually, I try to sleep every night, but... Um, sometimes better than others. But just before I woke up, the Lord spoke some words to me, and it was this, the final solution. And he just left it there. So I woke up, and I began to meditate upon what he had spoken and what it was for, and I felt like it was a word that I was to share with the church. And being born shortly after World War II, it was a term that was used in World War II by Adolf Hitler. And he had come to power in Germany uh, as a result of essentially combining the people of Germany with a thought and the thought was, we have to get rid of the Jewish people in all of Europe because they are the problem that's caused us to be what we are today. And he put out all kinds of propaganda, uh, dehumanizing the Jewish people. Even though the Jewish people were productive, they were a blessing, they were faithful, he wanted to eradicate them. See, the enemy always tries to blame somebody else for our problems. And Adolf Hitler met with his council, and they came up with this, the final solution to the Jewish question. And they came up with a plan to eradicate Jews from all over Europe. And they had death camps. And they shipped them there, and they tried to wipe out all the Jews. Six million Jews were destroyed in the Holocaust, along with 15, 15 million other people. But can I tell you that Adolf Hitler was not successful? He died. Israel was birthed in 1948 and is standing strong today. And this is just a, a word of counsel and advice and warning to us that we should never stand against Israel, but with Israel. And as you're taking a look at the election coming up, I would just encourage you to see who stands with Israel and who does not. God still loves Israel today, and we do too. So his plan was unsuccessful, he's dead. And then I came up with this thought. Who did he think he was to come up with a final solution when he didn't have the final authority or the final say? But where did this evil come from? How could this happen in our world? And as we look a day, around today, what is happening to our world, all this evil there? Where did it come from? And I believe it came from the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning and take a look at what happened. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how did he do that? By speaking. And we know that the Trinity was involved, the Holy Spirit was there, and he was brooding over the face of the deep, kind of like a mother hen broods over her eggs, waiting for them to be born. And we also know that Jesus was there because in John 1 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God all things were created by him and through him and without him nothing was made that has been made and so father spoke word created the Holy Spirit hovered and the world came into existence and the Bible says that he created the world in six days. And I have just enough faith and belief in the miracle working God that it happened in six days. 
And on the sixth day, God created mankind in his image, in likeness, and he formed him out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And God fellowship with man. He walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And God planted a garden east in Eden, and he put all kinds of fruit-bearing trees that they were able to eat and enjoy. There were two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord told him he could eat anything he wanted except he could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Adam was alone, and the Lord says, I need to make a partner helper for him. And he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and he took from his side and created his wife, Eve. Now, men were created from the dust of the ground. Women were created from the side of man. So the first C-section that happened in the earth was from man. <laughs> The woman was born from the side of man. And from that point on, all the other human beings that were born were born from the woman. And they were put in this garden that God blessed. Eden means bliss and delight. And they were to watch over it and attend it and to take care of it. But one day, Adam allowed something in the garden that shouldn't have been there, the serpent. A serpent came into the garden and began to speak to Eve. And I want you to watch what the serpent does. He begins to question God. That's where it starts, questioning God. And he says to the woman, did God really say that you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve said, the Lord allowed us to eat from any tree in the garden, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or even touch it or we would die. Did God say that? He didn't say anything about touching it. You see, you get in trouble when you start adding things to what God said. And then he accuses God. He said, you won't really die. In other words, God is a liar. And also, God wants to keep something from you. Because he knows that when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be just like God knowing good and evil, and he's trying to keep that from you. Well, there was one thing that God was trying to keep from them, evil. They were already like God. They were created in his image and likeness. They were created for eternity. They were, they were in this tropical paradise. They had it made. All they had to do was follow God. God came out to walk with them in the cool of the day. And Eve believed the serpent more than God. And she began to peer at this tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil and saw the fruit that was pleasant to the eye, good for eating, and they were going to gain knowledge. And so she partook of it. And then she wanted to share this good thing that she had had with her husband here. <laughs> okay, dear. <laughs> and so he partook. And the Bible said they were naked, but when they ate, they were aware that they were naked and they covered themselves up. They sewed fig leaves together to cover up their nakedness and their shame. And they heard God walking through the, through the garden and they hid themselves. Never before had they hid themselves from God. They walked in close community and fellowship one with another. And so God called out to Adam, where are you, Adam? I'm, I'm hiding because I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you been eating from the tree I told you not to? Well, well Lord, it was that woman that you gave me. She gave it to me and I ate it. It's her fault. So then he turns to the woman. Not my fault, the devil made me do it. When the enemy works, John 10, 10 says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And what he does, he begins to cause us to try to doubt God, to try to blame God, to try to believe that God is something that he is not. 
and to usurp authority. And when we fall into his trap, we take upon ourselves the evil because we've been eating from the wrong tree. And so the Lord had to expel them from the garden and he took off the, li- the fig leaves and he's, he killed an animal, I believe that he killed a lamb and covered them with the skin of the lamb to cover their nakedness and they left. I believe that there's a blood covenant that goes through the entire Bible from the Garden of Eden that covers us now that's for our blessing and our benefit. So what happened as a result of that tree of evil that was eaten and released into the earth? Ten generations later came a man by the name of Noah. And God looked at the earth, this creation, this beautiful thing that he had birthed and and that he had blessed and that he had partnered with. And he saw the evil in the world. And it says this, that man's every thought was given to evil continually. And then he found Noah, who was a man that walked in righteousness in his generation. And he called him to build an ark of safety. And he was a preacher of righteousness. But as he preached, only his family believed. And so Noah and his three sons, him, Shem, and Japheth, got on the ark along with their wives. And the Lord caused the animals to come to the ark, a pair of every kind except for the clean animals. And there were seven pairs. And they got into the ark. And God sent a worldwide flood to cleanse the earth of all the sin and shame that was there. When Noah got off of the ark, he blessed God and he took a sacrifice and he offered it unto the Lord. An interesting thing, though, that God said that I'd really like as a hunter. (laughs) He said, before you've been eating of the vegetables and, and of the things that grow on the trees, from now on, all the animals are your food. Hallelujah. Protein. Amen. (laughs) And so God has blessed us in many different ways. Ten generations from Noah came a man by the name of Abram. And he was 75 years old. His wife, Sarai, was 65. And the Lord spoke to Abram and he says, I want you to leave your land and I want you to go to a land I will show you. And to take your wife... And I will bless you, and your offspring will be a blessing, and they will fill the earth, and they will become like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the sky. There was only one problem. Sarai was barren. She didn't have any children. Okay, this should be good news for us, but he called him when he was 75. There's hope for us, you older people. Thank you, Lord. God's not finished with us yet. Amen. Our best days are ahead. And so Abram believed him, and the Lord led him to the land that is Israel today. And the Lord said, uh, walk it out, and every place you walk, I will give it to you as an eternal inheritance. And I will give you a son. He showed up at 99 years of old, and the Lord said, I will give you a son, and through your seed... All nations would be blessed. And by the way, your name is not going to be Abram anymore. It's going to be Abraham. Abram means father. Abraham means father of nations. And your wife is no longer going to be called Sarai. She will be Sarah. Her name Sarai means princess. Her word Sarah means woman of honor. And so, he said, I'll come back next year. You're going to have the child. So at 100 years old... Isaac was born, Sarah was 90, can you imagine that? And the Lord blessed them. We are still, if you hear my voice and hear my heart, we are still under the Abrahamic covenant. And we are children of Abraham if we walk in faith. So, 
chapter 22 of Genesis, it says the Lord spoke to Abraham, and he says, I want, you to, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to go to the area of Moriah, a place I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice your son to me and offer him up to me as a burnt offering. Now, understand, they'd been waiting for this boy for a long time. But Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so the very next day, he gets up, he cuts wood, he puts it on the donkey, he takes his son, Isaac, and he takes two servants, and they go three days to the place where God showed him to go. Now, that's faith, and that's obedience. And when they get there, he speaks to the servants and said, you guys wait here for us. Isaac will go worship, and then we will come back to you. Was it, what was he going for? To sacrifice his son. Now, Isaac was familiar with worshiping the Lord, and they started up the mountain, and Isaac said, well, uh, okay, here's the firewood, there's the fire, and there's the knife. Now, Abraham was an old man, so he put the firewood upon Isaac, and he carried the firewood, and Abraham carried the knife and the fire, and they went on together. And Isaac said, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham prophesied and spoke in faith and said, the Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. So they got to the place where the Lord showed him. He built an altar. He laid down the firewood. He tied up his son, laid him on the altar, and he was ready to sacrifice his son. He drew his knife, raised it up, and all of a sudden the Lord said, don't do it. Don't touch him. Now I know that you love me and you won't withhold anything from me, even your very own son. And there in the thicket was a ram caught by his horns, a male in his prime, and Abraham sacrificed him. And on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. He called that place, the Lord will provide. Can I tell you that 42 generations later, on that same mountain, God himself provided a lamb for the sacrifice. His name is Jesus. And he did not withhold his son from us. And we receive the full benefit of his life and blessings. There was a blood covenant that carried over from the book of Genesis all through our lifetime now. Later on, Seven generations from Abraham, there was a man by the name of Moses. And Moses was the, was the lawgiver. Moses found himself in Egypt <laughs> as a result of uh, the Egyptians being afraid that the Israelites would turn on them, and they were kept in captivity. When they went there, there were 75 souls, and now they're way over a million souls. And they were there in captivity. And the Lord was going to release his people and the message from Moses to Pharaoh is, let my people go. Pharaoh wouldn't do it. And the Lord sent plagues. And the Lord said, I'm going to send one more plague, and then he will let my people go. And the plan was for the protection of Israel. They chose a lamb, a male without defect. And they offered him, and they put the blood on the doorposts and lintels of their homes. And that night the Lord sent the death angel through Egypt. And every place he saw the blood, he passed over those homes. But every home that did not have the blood, destruction came. And so the people of Israel was released because God saw the blood of the lamb. Can I tell you today that we carry the blood of the lamb? And death and destruction has no part of us. We are protected. Moses was a lawgiver, and there were, ten, there were ten laws that the Lord, the Ten Commandments. And how many people kept all Ten Commandments? No one. no one. Not a single one of them. Romans 3.23 says, all is sin and comes short of God's glory. So the Jews thought that was really good, so they added another 613 <laughs> that they couldn't keep either. 
Well, that brings us to now. What about now? The Bible tells us that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those that were under the law that we might be adopted as sons of God. You see, the law was based upon human performance and every human being failed at keeping the law. So we needed a plan where someone else performed for us that we didn't have to perform for ourselves. Jesus came in the fullness of time, born of a woman, not a man, but born of a woman, and he lived perfect according to the law. He fulfilled the law. So he was our Passover lamb. He was examined by the law and found to be innocent. And God, it says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So he paid the price for us so that we could be declared innocent and righteous. How about this? Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He calls us righteous. And all those who walk in faith are the children of Abraham. The law was only for a period of time. The law came, and, and it was in effect until the seed that was promised to Abraham, uh, Abraham came. That seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are free from the curse of the law. It's called the law of sin and death. How many are glad that we're no longer under that law? But we're living under a brand new covenant, which was paid for by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is so amazing and so wonderful. I just want to share a few scriptures with you here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21... talks about this being the righteousness of God. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it's the gift of God. For we are God's workmanship, we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. And we become the sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says this, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. So we have a way. His, the way is Jesus. And so God has a final solution for all mankind to give us freedom and everything that we need to conduct life. And it's a good life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are free in him. Thank you, Lord. John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world, he didn't hate the world, he loved the world, that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For all who believe in him, all who believe in his name are not condemned, but those who do not believe stand condemned already because they do not believe in the name of Jesus. How many believe in the name of Jesus today? Thank you, Lord. So Jesus is our final solution. So we know that Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. He was our Passover lamb. He was crucified at the time of Passover. But he rose from the dead on the third day. And then in John chapter 20, he shows up. And he speaks to his disciples. And he's, he said, he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And they were born again from above. It's, it's kind of like in the creation when God breathed into that lump of clay, the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Now God breathes into us in the Holy Spirit and we become born again into the life of God. Thank you, Jesus. So, after Jesus rose from the dead, he meets with his disciples in Acts chapter 1. He meets with them for 40 days. And so, they had a Jesus conference. 
with Jesus for 40 days, and he, in, he taught the intensified word of God through the Holy Spirit about the kingdom of God. 40 days. They were fully instructed. And during this session, Jesus gave them a command. They had been born again already, but he gave them a command. And he said, don't leave here until you receive the promise of the Father, which you've heard me talk about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, it wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. We are told that 500 people saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And there were two groups of people. There were 380 Brill Cream Christians. How about you? Most people don't even know what Brill Cream is. Back in the old days, Brill Cream was something that you used for your hair. And, and their theme was a little dab will do you. I used Brill Cream and look what it did for me. So there were 380 real cream Christians, and they didn't do what Jesus told them to do. They were satisfied with a little dabble, do you? 120 were disciples. Jesus, uh, you know, we've been talking about being a disciple and making disciples. And, and Chris talked recently about the question are we disciples? Am I a disciple? I believe that a disciple is a ready hearer, learner, and doer of everything the rabbi teaches. And a disciple is one who eagerly desires everything that the rabbi has for us. And so Jesus told him, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit will enable you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the earth. And so the 120 went upstairs, and that included Mary, his mother, and his brothers, the apostles. They wanted everything their rabbi had for them, and they waited. And they continued steadfastly in prayer until they received that which the Father promised. Jesus was crucified at the Passover feast. There were three times a year that every male was supposed to present himself to the Lord. At Passover, at Pentecost, which was 50 days after Passover, which was the feast of the first fruits, and then the feast of tabernacles, which is the final harvest. And so, in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the 120, were all in one place, in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them divided tongues like as a fire, and it rested upon all of them, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Pretty cool stuff. Really interesting story, but some years ago, Amy and I were in Israel, and we went up to the place where they called the upper room. It, sure, it wasn't, but we were in the upper room. <laughs> An amazing thing happened. All of a sudden, we heard a rushing mighty wind and filled the place where we were sitting, and everybody began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave us the utterance. Really. Anyway, the disciples began to filter out into the streets. And the Jews had been gathered from all the nations. There, they were there for the Feast of Pentecost to honor God. And when these disciples began to speak with other tongues, the people of other languages heard what they were saying in their own language because of the Holy Spirit. 
And, and if you ever wonder what you're speaking when you're speaking in other tongues, you're declaring the wonderful works of God. And so the people of Jerusalem were wondering, what is this all about? What does this mean? And Peter began to preach to them about the meaning. He said, this is that that Joel prophesied about, that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We are living in the last days. That was the start of it. He would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters would prophesy. Your old men would dream dreams, or maybe they'll hear what God speaks in the nighttime. Or, and your young men will see visions. And on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show you wonders in the heavens and signs on the earth, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord during this time will be saved. That's what it says. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, when I think of this, I think, okay, well, Lord, here I am, help me. But to call upon in this text, the word means to be surnamed. To be surnamed. To call upon the Lord, to be surnamed. Surnamed with the name of the Lord. When does this happen in, in our culture? I thought of this example. <clears throat> On November 24th, 1966, there was this guy that was 19 and a half years old and a girl that was 18 years in one day, and we went to the Sunbury Church of Christ to be married. On Thanksgiving Day, who, who gets married on Thanksgiving Day? <laughs> Reason being, we got four days off so we could spend some time together before we had to go back to work. So we didn't expect anybody to be there, but the church was filled. And so the pastor, Norman Gent, led us in our vows, our marriage vows. And then he said, you may kiss the bride. And then he said this, for the first time anywhere, I want to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Bill Stevens. And at that moment, the bride took on the surname of the groom. Amen? All right, we'll get into some more of this, but she took on my name. We collectively are the bride of Christ, and we need to be surnamed with the name of our groom, and his name is? Jesus. Jesus. All right, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Peter went on to say that Jesus was accredited by God to you by the signs, miracles, and wonders he performed. And you, with the help of evil men, have put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But it was impossible for death to keep his grip upon him. And now he is exalted to the right hand of the Father, and we are eyewitnesses of the fact that he has been raised from the dead. And he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, which he has poured out upon you, which you have now seen and heard. And he goes on to say one more thing. God wants you to know that this Jesus whom you crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. The people were convicted. They were cut to the heart. And they asked this question, what must we do? Good question. Peter did not say Romans 10, 9 and 10. Do you know what that says, right? It, man, if you, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. For with your mouth you're made right, or with your heart you're made right with God, and with your mouth you confess unto salvation. Is that a true scripture? Yes, yes it is. And so I've, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, baptism isn't really necessary. 
for salvation. It's just an act of obedience. Well, so if you don't get baptized, that means you're disobedient? <laughs> Let's go on to say, what, what, this is what he did say. What must we do? Repent and be baptized if you want to. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. That was the message. That was the salvation message that he gave to the church. And this was a message that's repeated over and over and over again all through the book of Acts. We are so blessed to have the book of Acts to see what the church did and how they functioned. How about this? When Jesus was giving the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make converts. Oh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In Mark's gospel, he said, go into all the earth and preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom to all creation. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And these signs will follow those that believe. In my name, cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And then he ascends into heaven. And the Bible says they went everywhere preaching the good news. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed their word with signs following. The Lord is still active today. He's still baptizing today. But the message he gave them was repent. Repent. I used to think that meant I'm sorry for my sins and stop being bad and being good. That kind of sounds like the law to me. It's performance-based. I can't make myself be good. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. But to repent means to have a change of thinking, which leads to a change of action and purpose. We, we repent when we, he, when we receive the knowledge of the truth, and we begin to be like him as we see the truth and we have the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to bring about the change. And then after we've repented, we are baptized, which means to be immersed in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of like a wedding ceremony. And we are surnamed with the name of the Lord. I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. His name is pronounced upon us. And then we receive the promise of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever gone to buy a car? Sometimes it's a good experience and Sometimes it isn't. Um, can you put up illustration number one? So if you went to buy a car, and this was what was brought out, w would you s be happy with that? Okay, so this represents repentance. Repentance. You have a change of thinking, you want a car, and, and I, we begin to change. But this car is just, it's part of a car. Uh, it's kind of like the shell of a car. It's a beginning, uh, but it's not been painted. It has no motor. It has no seats. But we could load it up on a trailer and take it home and say, uh, that's my car. 
And then maybe two or three years later, we could load it back on the trailer and take it back to the dealer and put up illustration number two. And then we would immerse the car and it would have the emblem on it declaring what it is. It's been surnamed. It might have some seats that we could sit in it and we could go someplace if we were parked on a hill. Or we could put somebody in it and we could push real hard, and, but we wouldn't be very productive. What's missing? The powertrain. Illustration number three. That is a car. You can see that it's got everything, it's got the seats, it's got the lights, it's got the wheels, and it's got the powertrain, and it even speaks in tongues. Vroom, 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 vroom. Now we can go somewhere, now we can accomplish something. I, I think sometimes as Christians, we give a divided picture of salvation. You know, we, we give them Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's kind of like the repentance part. And, and baptism is not really essential. It's just an act of obedience. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is another option. But can I tell you, that's not the way it was presented in the New Testament church. They gave them the whole thing. The whole package where they didn't have to limp along in life for years and years and years, and then finally they had a revelation, hey, I don't have to walk powerless. I can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Jesus, it says it's for me and my children and all that is far off, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, all that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call, and he's still calling. Today is a time that we need to really be discipling people. How many of you believe that we're going to see a revival like we've never seen before? Yeah. A world-changing revival. And so what we're doing in our group this year is we're discipling disciple makers. And we have 21 people that are signed up for that. 22, sorry, 22. Okay, <clears throat> And, and this disciple-making class is just full of young people. <laughs> Philip and Marion, for example. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And Amy and I and other people. You're never too old to be a disciple-maker. And so we're, we're teaching people how to disciple others and give them a track to run on so that when people come to want to know the Lord, we are prepared to take them through discipleship so that they can walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and do what God has called us to do, which is to be witnesses in all the earth and make disciples. Let's, let's talk a minute about what are the foundations of the faith? Well, we know that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. It's been laid by the apostles and prophets. <clears throat> but Hebrews chapter 6 talks about the foundations of the faith. And, and it, it says, these are the elementary teachings. <laughs> the elementary teachings. This is just the first teachings. And from here, we go on to build the rest of the building. And it lists out what they are. Repentance from dead works or works that lead to death. A, a, long, a lot of Christians are living under the old covenant and the new covenant. Right? They're trying to keep the law in their own power and authority, but also partake of the things of the Lord. Jesus fulfilled the old covenant so that we could walk in the new covenant. So anything that we're trusting in to be uh, our faith, uh, we're living is a dead work. Repentance from dead works, of faith in God, of the doctrines of baptisms, 
Baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) And laying on of hands. What do we lay hands on people for? Receive healing for an impartation of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To bless people, to send them out to accomplish the works that God has called them to do. To release them to the fullness of all that God has for them. And of the resurrection of the dead. Everybody is going to be resurrected from the dead. But there's two destinations. And, And we don't want anybody to go to hell. But we want them to all live in life eternal. God has set eternity in the heart of man. And then also eternal judgment. Everybody's going to be judged. For Christians, that should not be a scary thing. We are judged righteous to enjoy the blessings of the Lord all the days of our life. So those are just the primary teachings. Those are the elementary teachings of the faith. And then from there, we go on to build the rest of the house. We cannot live apart from anything that God has for us. Amen? So what was the practice in the New Testament? How did they walk out what we've been taught? Everything was going really good in Jerusalem. Jesus commissioned them and sent them out to take the gospel to all parts of the earth. But the Christians were pretty comfortable in Jerusalem. Everything was going well, and they just stayed there. Then Saul came, the persecutor of the church. Stephen was martyred. Saul was there. And the Bible says there was a great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem against the Christians. And the Christians scattered everywhere. Except for the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem. Well, one of the Deacons, Philip, went to Samaria, and he preached the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And you know what? The Lord worked with him. Signs happened. Devils were cast out. People were healed. People responded to the gospel. It's been said that signs, miracles, and wonders are the dinner bell of the gospel. You know why we don't see more signs, miracles, and wonders? Because we're comfortable in Jerusalem. Maybe when we begin to go out and do what Jesus called us to do, the signs will begin to follow us more often too. And then when we step out in faith and do what God has called us to do, great things can happen. So he went there and he gave the gospel message. People responded and he baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like they were commanded here on the day of Pentecost. And that was wonderful. But nobody received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so he could have just left them, but how many of you know they would have just been the, the, the painted car? He knew these people needed the powertrain in the car. And so he sent for the apostles in Jerusalem, and Peter and John came down to lay hands on these people who had been baptized in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit baptized them fresh and new, and now they were equipped as disciples to go and do what God had called them to do. And it happened over and over and over and over again. It's still happening. But what happens if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you still need to be baptized in water? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) I'm going to be finished in just a minute. And then we're going to pick up with part two next week. And here's what we're going to do next week. I'm going to finish my teaching And then we're going to baptize people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are going to be surnamed with the name of Jesus next week. 
the, uh, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to ask Jesus to pour out the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Even for people that have already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how many of you know we need to be baptized fresh and new? That's going to happen next week. So come with expectation to receive. And if you're going to get baptized, wear the clothes you're going to be baptized in, but bring some extras. Is there anybody that wants to be baptized next week? That's all right. It's all right. There will be. There will be. Acts chapter 10 is a really important chapter for us non-Jews. Because up till chapter 10 in the book of Acts, the Jews thought only Jews could be saved. They didn't understand the promise that was made to Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed, even us Gentiles. So in Acts chapter 10, there was a man by the name of Cornelius. He was a centurion from Rome who was over 100 soldiers. And he loved the Lord. He loved the Jewish people. He was good to them. And one day in the afternoon, he was praying. And the Lord spoke to him. And he said, your prayers have come up as a memorial to me from you. So I want you to send to Joppa for a man by the name of Peter who will come and give you words of life. So Cornelius sent his messengers to Joppa to go get Cornelius or to get Peter to, to come back with the words of life. And, and in Joppa, Peter was on the roof of the house praying and the Bible says he fell into a trance. And while he was in this trance, he saw this sheet or tablecloth let down from heaven by the four corners. And when it was opened up, it contained all kinds of animals that the Jews thought were unclean. And the Lord told him to kill and eat. And I'm sure that he probably had the pig come up before him and that had bacon on it. <laughs> and Peter said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. The Lord speaks to him and said, what I have called clean, don't you call common and unclean. About this time, the messengers from Cornelius come, and the Lord said, go with him. And so Peter and his companions went to Cornelius' household. And when he got there, Cornelius had invited all his family, his friends, his neighbors, and the house was packed because they were waiting on a message from God. They valued the word that was to come to them. And Peter was just amazed that all these people had gathered together and he began to preach about the kingdom of God and about Jesus being the son of God. And then he was raised from the dead on the third day. And he said, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And he didn't even have to give it an invitation or an altar call. God interrupted what he was saying because all of a sudden, these Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Peter couldn't believe it. The other Jews who came with him couldn't believe it either that they had received the Holy Spirit just like they had on the day of Pentecost. And then he asked this question, who can stop these people from being baptized since God has already filled them with the Holy Spirit? And even though they have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter commands them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he baptized them. Repentance, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, a good foundation start to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I'll tell you what I believe a disciple is. A disciple is one who eagerly hears learns and does what the rabbi teaches. And he's open to everything 
that the master, the rabbi has for them. I believe that we really need to be disciples in this hour and be ready to accomplish what God has commissioned us to do, which is to go make disciples. God bless you. Next week, baptism of water, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Come expecting. Father, I thank you today that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we want to be ready learners for whatever you want to teach us. And Lord, we don't want to teach the thing, we don't want to be uh, the Brill Cream Christians, a little dabble do us, but Lord, we want everything that you have for us, every single thing. So Lord, I thank you that you would bless your people today, use them for your kingdom and purpose, and Lord, I just speak the shalom of God over them in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.